much, everyone. I'm now being joined from Sokoto virtually by the Bishop of uh, the Catholic Church, Sokoto Dowsies, uh, the Most Reverend uh, Hudson Matthew Kuka, uh, who in his uh, Easter message gave some profound uh, uh, message on the way to go, the essence of Easter. Bishop Kuka sheds light on the path towards healing, offering insight crucial for our collective journey towards a more just and harmonious society. The most Reverend Dr. Matthew Kuka is the Bishop of the Catholic Church, Sokoto Dowsies. He's joining me live from Sokoto. Thank you so much, Bishop, for joining us. Uh, happy Easter to you. And perhaps a way to begin is to quickly get your view on the essence of Easter. What does this mean generally for Christians and for the world generally? Well, first of all, thank you very much, Sheol, and happy Easter to you. Uh, on a lighter note, uh, it was good listening to your previous guest, uh, Engineer Umahi, our Minister for Works. I'm happy to hear about the progress being made. I didn't know he had become a pastor because the last time we talked, I thought he was on his way to becoming a Catholic. But anyway, um, let me come back to the essence of your question. Look, I mean, Easter, because these things happen every year, we never seem to appreciate the fact that there is something fresh, something new for us to think about. And it's not just about us as Christians. There is an opportunity for us to pause for a moment and see how uh, Jesus Christ, his mission on earth, and how his mission on earth was about bringing light uh, to a dark world, and how his resurrection was an, an affirmation of the things that prophets had spoken about for hundreds of years before his coming. And I think this is really what sets Christianity apart. You know, I don't mean any disrespect, but this is why Christianity is what it is. And it's important that Christians understand, you know, that uh, before Jesus came, uh, prophets uh, over time had predicted his coming. And also, we can even say we had an address, and we almost had a telephone number, too, because we were told where he would be born. We were told um, how his birth was going to take place by a virgin. And then we also were told about his death. And, of course, the good thing is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ ticked all the boxes right. So it is important for Christians to understand that Jesus wasn't just a good man. Jesus wasn't just a teacher. And contrary to what some non-Christians tend to say, Jesus was not a prophet. Jesus was the subject and the object of prophecy. He was the fulfillment of prophecy. And his resurrection was the validation of that point. So it just gives us an assurance and an opportunity to reflect on the fact that the promises that God makes are promises that God always keeps. All right. I, I can see a nexus between your, what your, the essence, as we captured it tonight, of uh, the essence of Easter and your Easter message, which you uh, put a healing as a thematic preoccupation. And you, there is a nexus of that onto how it also extends to our nation. Why do you think we need healing? Look, this is a broken nation, a severely broken nation, a severely fractured nation. The evidence is before all of us. Uh, what we have been doing in the name of politics is just picking up the pieces. The entire country is, is, is littered, you know, with broken dreams, broken hopes, promises made and promises never fulfilled. Uh, indeed, the over 300 or 500 or maybe half, more than half a million abandoned projects that littered this country. It's a testament, you know, to the brokenness of our country. Um, the very fact that hundreds of Nigerian citizens are still in captivity uh, is evidence of the brokenness of our society. The evidence that the country is actually, in the last 10 or more years, has become almost a, grave, a graveyard of sorts. And that we're burying people in their hundreds, and we're not in a war. Uh, we don't need to look any further to explain how broken our country has been. And to say this is not to ascribe blame to an individual or to a particular government, is that we need to return to the scene of the crime to see the, the range of opportunities that we miss. And that's why I mentioned in my message that when we say the things we say, 
I'm not saying it to attack a government. And from where I stand, I have for the last 40 years paid quite a lot of attention to thinking and reflecting about the history, the progress, the culture, and where Nigeria should be going. So my, my messages are never really flippant. And I don't beg people to agree with me. I allow for the fact that many people will find areas of disagreement with the things I say. But we cannot quarrel with the fact that ours is a nation that desperately is in need of healing. And I think the right time is now, especially from the kind of things we are hearing that government is trying to do. A nation needs to heal, you know, before we can enjoy the infrastructure that uh, you have, your previous speaker spoke about. All right, uh, uh, Bishop. Yeah, so when you talk about this healing, where do we start from? I mean, reading your book, Witness to Justice, uh, and some of the things that you have highlighted and documented in the book gives an understanding of some sections of our history and our, and our past not so far. Where do we start this healing from? Is it something that the present government can begin, and how can he start it? Well, first, I have published two other books after Witness to Justice, um, and they all speak to some of the issues about why national cohesion is so important. Um, and it's not a question of where to start. It is really a question of even developing the will to start. Because if we develop the will to start, then we can begin to map out strategies. It's not something that government can do. Uh, and the government, of course, always likes to say that government cannot do everything. It is the case. Um, because if we map out where we really want to go, then we can assign roles and responsibilities to individuals, to families, and to communities. But there has to be a program of believability. There has to be evidence that the government tells us very clearly where it wants to go, how it hopes to get there, and how we fit into all of this. But we need to, first of all, accept the, the brokenness of our society, and that this brokenness is the result of our own handiwork. We are not under occupation. We are not in a, in, a, in a war with anybody. The British have since left. And uh, a lot of the mess that we now find ourselves is, is a mess that was created by us. So I think the first thing is to have the humility and the introspection to say, yes, you know, we can go on like this. This is not the way that this country was meant to be. Mistakes have been made. We are not even concerned about who made the mistakes, but that mistakes have been made. And that politics can... can provide a platform for helping with this healing. Um, and this is why, uh, like I said in my message, we need to see a much more robust program designed by government to help us go away from just lining up and collecting palliatives, so-called, when we are not in a war. I think it is uh, the height of indignity to see Nigerians lining up every day under the sun and waiting to collect bags of rice, which probably never come. Not because money has not been given, but because everybody who gives out money in Nigeria from the federal government, we know that a good part of this money is always stolen. And Nigerians are not looking for, for handouts. People, ordinary farmers just want to go back to their farms. People just want to be able to get on with their lives. And this is why ending insecurity is the beginning of this healing and a decisive program and plan for ending mm. insecurity within a timeline will be the beginning of this healing. Yeah, you talked about rejigging of uh, the architecture, the security architecture in Nigeria. But you have a perspective on that. How do you think we can go with that? Because you say that first and foremost, instead of handing out these and that, let's first and foremost, since we're not in a state of war, let's first of all make the farms and our society secure. When the government says they are rejigging architecture, what comes to mind and how do you think we can better tackle that kind of uh, situation? I'm not the commander-in-chief of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Uh, I'm also not the chief of one minister or the chief of defense. Staff. But on a more serious note, you know, what is very disheartening, I speak to, you know, people across the board. And I speak to people in the security agencies. I speak to policemen, I speak to the military, I speak to young people in the middle. And every, all we hear consistently and persistently is that young military officers are convinced that they can wipe out this nonsense called banditry and insecurity. But there is a feeling that at the top, 
there is no political will. I believe that the Nigerian military is pretty well equipped. The challenge we should ask, or the question we should ask ourselves, is how and why is it that fighting insecurity has become so instrumentalized um, to the point that it is looking as if ending insecurity is not something that there is a lot of enthusiasm about because it has become a meal ticket for quite a, a significant number of uh, people across the board. And I think that the president has the, the opportunity uh, that whatever it is that he dreams of doing, and I think that they have wonderful ideas, but it is important, and I don't think the president needs me to say this, but I think it needs to be said that without a secured nation, without a return of a certain level of feeling of dignity and a sense of belonging, as we said in our constitution, all the dreams that we may have about our roads and so on and so forth will come to nothing. So Nigerians need to have a country that they can believe in. Um, and as I said, I believe the infrastructure conversation is very, very important, very, very significant. And I can correlate the absence of infrastructure with the persistence of insecurity. Because all you need to do is to also say that if we have this road, the kind of roads that the Minister of Works is talking about, then of course you're not going to have all this uh, breed of human beings that are coming out of the middle of hell, you know, stopping people on the highway, you know, to do the things that they are doing. But I think there needs to be a pretty well-crafted message that tells us that this insecurity is going to end, and there is a timeline for that. Mm -hmm. They're not going to solve the problem by diluting the Nigerian military, by bringing in hunters and vigilantes. And all. This, is, this, is, this doesn't do justice to the professionalism of the Nigerian army. Uh, Bishop, you, 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 I mean, this, these are very deep uh, stuff. And I'm wondering, just maybe, we saw what happened in South Africa in the post-apartheid era. And maybe, just maybe, the, how many hours, the three or the four hours, uh, may come into function. Whether or not you talked about national integration in your message. Uh, just maybe, there might be a national reconciliation such that people will come to the table, agree for things, like you say, Nigerians will walk out of the room knowing full well that they've laid all this burden of their chest. Is that the kind of situation you're proposing? Absolutely. I mean, the idea of, a, of, a, of, a, of an Oputa panel um, is a huge mistake. Nigeria, actually, the federal government does not need to gather people again in a room. We do not need the injuries are very clear. The scars are on our faces. The wounds are everywhere. You can see them. And like somebody said, even a blind man can tell when it is raining. So we don't need to have any combat. Most of the documents in the Oputa panel laid the foundation for the things we're talking about. The, the so-called 2014 political reform, I mean, um, a political conference, taken together with what we did in, in 2005, um, 2004, um, there's enough documentation. And frankly, as far as I'm concerned, a government that is really serious, all it needs to do is to set up a small team of political scientists, economists, and people to just sit down and did some of those documentation and provide the country with a roadmap as to where to go. So you don't need to call. I mean, people exaggerate and over dramatize what happened at, at, uh, at you know in South Africa. I visited South Africa myself. I had meetings with with, uh, with, with you know with, with Archbishop Tutu. I went to the, I, you know I have traveled around Asia. I've visited and talked about truth commissions everywhere in the world. They never really meant to, full, to, to, to solve the problems that we always think. Everywhere you've had any of these conversations, the problem has always been that governments have never had to, never been able to develop the political will to carry through, you know, with the things that need to be done. So, but there are a lot of the ingredients, everything is already, you know, pretty well laid out. It's just a question of how and where government wants to look. But there is enough material. You don't need to call a confab. You don't need to call people in the room. All you need to do, the documents are there. You can dust them up. And there is enough material for chatting a way forward across the board for this country beyond the purview of politics. Yeah. I'm being, they're speaking to me, my yes, now from the control room. Uh, I just have about 60 seconds to go. But I have uh, two uh, tier uh, questions for you, sir. Uh, one being that you talked about the minority question in Nigeria. That's a major one. 
and uh, even some majority feels like a minority in the equation. How do we resolve that too? Is it in line with what you said? Well, you know, I mean, minority is, uh, is merely, I don't know, when we talk about minorities, Nigerians like to talk about minorities in terms of numbers. But, you know, in an unjust and in an unfair country such as Nigeria is, there has to be a mechanism for making sure that people are included, even when they didn't register to be included. By being a citizen of Nigeria, the fact that I'm a Christian, the fact that I'm a Muslim, the fact that I'm military, the fact that I'm a man, the fact that I'm a woman, nothing should foreclose the possibility of me enjoying the opportunities that this great country has given to us. And what we have in Nigeria is that people have instrumentalized all kinds of identity. Some have instrumentalized religion as a tool of, of oppression and exclusion. Some have, made, you know, uh, we, you know, they weaponized gender as a tool of oppression and exclusion. So it, the real essence of democracy is to dismantle all these institutions and structures of oppression that have worked for a few. I mean, if you take a place like northern Nigeria, a lot has been said. Not very little needs to be added. No, the Northerners have ruled this country more than any other group of people, if, if, if you want to use that category. And if you want to say Muslims have governed this country more than any other, you can use that category. But how do you explain the fact that on almost every index of human survival, you know, Northern Nigeria is still embarrassingly coming last. How do you explain the fact that geographically, geopolitically, you know, the whole scene of the crime of, of banditry and kidnapping and all that is rotten and evil and inhuman is taking place within the, you know, the confines of northern Nigeria. This calls for, for, for northerners to speak to themselves. But of course, it also speaks to those who, are, you know, who hold the reins of power. But for me as a Christian, I shouldn't be here in northern Nigeria feeling that because I'm worshipping a religion that is different, therefore there are rights that, are, that shouldn't come to me so simply because of religion. Or you go somewhere else you know, that Muslims are not necessarily in the majority, to be a minority simply means to be out of the loop of power and loop of, you know, right. the loop of opportunity. Yeah. But, but Bishop, as we go now, just in 20 seconds, this government is just about nine to 10 months old in office. But as young as it is in office, what we want as a nation is for us to get it right. We cannot have a government that is dilly-dallying or trying and, try, trying and uh, you know, trying it here and there. We want a government that will get it right. If there's one thing that is in your mind that you think this government needs to watch and fix, what would that be? Just in 30 seconds so that we can close. Yeah, I don't know about getting it right. I mean, for, first of all, we are dealing with over 200 billion people. It, to get it right, it's not an easy thing to do. But I think we need to, we can see pretty clearly, and I tried to make the case in my message. Some people were a little bit disappointed that I wasn't firing on all cylinders. Really, this is not, I'm ready to give this government a chance, you know, because of where we have just come from. Not because of the great things they've done, but when I look back at where we've come from, I will support anybody that can take us away from what, where we just came from. So, and I think that my problem with the government is that, and I made the point in my message, there needs to be a robust communication strategy that explains to people what government wants to do. Almost the kind of thing that the Minister for, for, you know, for Works was saying. And we all, but most important, most important, it is that government needs to end insecurity and end it now. Because there are uh, allegations of complicity at the highest level. We don't need that. And as long as this cloud is hanging, there will be you know, right. crisis of credibility. Mm. Thank you so much, uh, Bishop uh, Matthew Asen Kuka. Uh, the Right Reverend has been speaking with us tonight. He's a bishop of the Catholic Church, Dos Sokoto Diocese, and is a preacher of conscience. Thank you so much indeed for your time tonight. I appreciate your, your special Thank, you. Thank you so much. And a happy a Easter to you. Easter. Thank you so much. Happy Easter to you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.